Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. We trust that your day has been good and we trust to know something of God's blessing as we meet around his word. Let's turn to God and seek his face in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we thank you for the good things that we've met with this day. And we thank you that we're able to affirm with one of all, truly God is good to Israel. You are wonderfully good, wonderfully kind. Uh, your mercies, they are new every morning. And teach us, Lord, always, we pray, to count up the blessings and to reflect upon your wonderful kindness, to keep from our hearts growing bitter or resentful, but rather, rather to be in that place of thankfulness and joy. You've taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. And so, Lord, we uh, pray these prayers before you, asking that you would remember us and that you would do us good as we come now to your word. We've eaten good food, but give us your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we um, met here on Tuesday evening and we've begun to, uh, begun to look uh, rather in, into uh, the, the letters to the seven churches at the start of the book of Revelation. We took a look um, last week into the letter to Ephesus and it's back to that letter that we come this week. We were able to see the positives there. This week we're going to see a slightly different um, tone, but I'm going to read the same verses. So that's Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7. Let us hear God's word. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, we really do thank God for his word and we look forward to looking into that again in a few moments time. But before we do that, we're going to turn to God in prayer. So let's pray. Father, we do gladly come into your presence and it does bring us enormous joy to call upon your name. In this world, we find so much that is difficult um, so many problems, so many things, oh God, that, that cause us unease. And yet we know that our Heavenly Father, in all of this, cares for us. We know that our Heavenly Father has plans and purposes. We, we can't see these things clearly, but we thank you for the assurance that you'll never leave us, never forsake us. And we thank you, oh God, that we can look forward to the glory of eternity with hearts that will no longer have sin with lips that will always be true, with minds, O oh God, that will always think in the right way. We thank you for the prospect of eternity and glory and to be with Jesus. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would go on working in our lives, even through these difficult things, to ready us for that day when we meet the Saviour. Grant us, O oh God, we pray, that we may not simply um, be partakers of the troubles that God sends to teach us, but that we may be learners from the troubles that God sends us. Give us an ear, we pray, as we've read there this evening, to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Grant us, O oh God, that we may not be full of our uh, own ideas, that we may not be full of our own judgments, our own thoughts. Give us, we pray, to hear the word. Give us, O oh God, we pray, in this world in which we live, to be um, even handed, to be uh, seeking to, to know and to understand what is right. 
Give us, Heavenly Father, that we may recognize those words um, through Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things who can know it. Grant us, O God, we pray, to, to know the, the deep down truth of those words and not to be found trusting ourselves, not to be found trusting the heart, but always coming with a, a, a real, a true lowliness of heart, a distrust of self, but looking to God and to the God of grace who sent his son into the world. We come to you there. We want to thank you for the good things that we have met with today. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, when we stop and think and when we reflect upon the many, many blessings that we have, how uh, very, very kind you are, how ungrateful we have been, but how kind you are. And we, we do ask you, Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, to value and to treasure all that is ours. We thank you this evening for the freedoms. We've heard so much of Ukraine and all the goings on with Russia there. And Lord, we want to bring that before you, but before even we get there, Lord, we, we want to thank you that we, we've known so much of ease. Our days have been so much easier. And we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We can be in church. We can come and call upon your name. We can seek your face. We can cry out to you. We thank you for these many, many, many blessings. We pray, Lord, Help us to value them and to treasure them. Keep us from the complaining spirit of Israel of old. Oh, how they complained. Lord, keep us from complaining, we pray. They've, they've, all, they've always had something to moan and groan and to complain about. Keep us from that awful spirit of moaning and groaning, we pray. Help us that we may, despite our troubles, know the joy of the Lord to be our strength. We do want to pray for the Ukraine. We want to pray for Russia as well tonight. This is a very perplexing situation. And Lord, we've seen the pictures, we've heard the stories. These are very, very upsetting to us, but how much worse for folk in the Ukraine facing these things, for those who are seeking to, to, to flee the country, and even Lord, for Russian folk who perhaps are wondering what is going on and Lord we want to try and understand we want to be in their place and we pray that you would remember remember especially Christians in all of this and we do immediately recognize that there are Christians in Ukraine there are Christians in Russia and oh Lord what a an awful situation that we're in we pray, remember us with mercy. And if it please you, Lord, that ways may be found to, to pull back from all of this, to, to sort issues out in a, 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 a more friendly, a more understanding, a more considerate way. Lord, we pray to you this evening. Help us, Heavenly Father. We pray your blessing upon our sister congregations that will meet this evening. We pray that you would do them good. We pray for all your servants who will uh, deliver your word, that you would grant, Lord God, to be faithful, to be wise in this day and age, wise as serpents, harmless as doves, to be wise, O God, um, and to be ready, to be firm, to be true with the words of God. Help, O oh God, that your servants would not be afraid of the faces of men. But rather, O oh God, that they would fear to displease their God. So be with us, we pray. Cause your face to shine upon us and bless us. And remember us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have begun to look into these letters to the seven churches. This wonderful book of Revelation is there. Um, for practical purposes, all God's word has a practical end. It's not there as a study book. We refer to Bible study and um, to me at least that conjures up the idea that we're prepared to spend perhaps more time actually uh, getting to, to grips with what the word is saying and looking at some of the detail and technicality. Um, but the, the Bible is not there in order that we may just load our heads with the truth detached from our hands. It's there for a practical purpose. 
And we've seen that the, the immediate focus of the book is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who walks in the midst of the seven churches. He's the author. Now, the book comes from God. It's given to Christ. We read God the Spirit is here. Um, he's described as the sevenfold spirit. And, and we also, have, of course, have John. John is um, one of the apostles, uh, usually understood to be the last surviving apostle. He's in exile. Um, he's on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He had spoken up for God. He's in trouble. But he's at worship. It's the Lord's day. He tells us that. And as he's at worship in the spirit, God comes and gives him this wonderful book. Now, the letters to the seven churches, well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is writing. He's the one who's in the midst. And we saw that description of what he looks with. Looks like rather a garment down to the feet, girded about with a golden band and so on. His head and his hair were white. And out of his mouth is this um, double-edged sword. And he's the one who speaks. And he's in the midst of the churches. And in addition to that, um, this reference here to the seven stars which evidently are the, well, we might say the angels of the churches, but the word angelos um, often to be translated as the messengers. And so I think we understand here, here are God's servants and they're upheld um, by the Lord Jesus Christ. The seven stars are in his right hand. He's the one who places them. He's the one who upholds them. He's the one who keeps them. They're his servants. And he's writing through them now to the churches. And he's written to Ephesus. Now, the letter to Ephesus um, has some very encouraging things. Because um, we uh, see the Lord Jesus saying, Well, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. They had not tolerated wrong in the church. They dealt with some who claimed they were apostles. They dealt with others who were described here as Nicolaitans. They've been faithful to God's word. What a wonderful truth that is. But there's a sad side, and it's to that sad side that we have to come this evening. We read, sad to say, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. It's an awful indictment. It's one that um, is fairly well remembered. It's one of the, the things that tends to get remembered from the, the letters to the seven churches, along with the letter to Laodicea, where the Lord Jesus says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, and so on. These are very powerful pictures for us, aren't they? And uh, so it's to that um, sort of negative side that we're going to have to pay attention this evening. Three things to notice. The complaint voiced, Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's voicing the complaint. The correction required. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. The consequence declared. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. They're very powerful words. The complaint voiced, the correction required, the consequence declared. First of all, then, to begin with, the complaint voiced. Now, I'm sure we're all very um, familiar in this day and age with the technology that tends to get used in all sorts of fields. We might immediately think of the medical field, and you, you have to go for an x-ray. You might have to go for a CT scan or an MRI scan. You uh, might have to go for an ultrasound scan. Something is amiss. They want to, to find out what the problem is, and they're able to see inside well sort of anyway they're able to get some sort of representation of what's going on inside your car your car is playing up um, there are problems with the the car and um, in this day and age to diagnose often it seems to be the case that the car needs to be hooked up to a computer and the computer whatever the form of it um, small or larger has to to sort of interrogate what's usually referred to as the brain. There's this part of your car, it's sort of a thousand pound touch, and it's the brain, the brain. It controls what the car does and so on. 
You might have problems with the electrics in your house and you're baffled. And you call the electrician to come round and what does he do? Well, he brings out his meter and he starts to put his meter in various places and he's able to come up with the solution. You might have problems with some damp in your house and it's likely that, um, you know, someone will come and they'll use one of those little damp meters and they'll be checking where is the problem and so on. In so many areas of life, it's likely that some sort of contraption, some sort of meter is going to arrive on the scene. And we're very used to that. Um, it's one of those things that happens. The Lord Jesus Christ needs none of that technology to know what is going on in the church. He knows exactly what is going on in the church. Every last detail, every raised eyebrow every furrowed brow. He knows the lot. There's nothing hidden from him. When we come into his presence on the Lord's day, how careful we need to be for our attitude of heart. He knows. He knows. And so you can be, you know, finely dressed and all the rest of it, but what about the attitude of your heart? Now, in this letter, he's already given um, his church, some splendid encouragement. And it's wonderful to be encouraged, isn't it? If you've got somebody who encourages you in life, you'll probably um, be only too pleased to meet up with them. And to the contrary, there are folk who always seem to be discouraging. But wonderful to be an encourager. And wonderful in the Christian life, especially to be an encourager, someone who urges others to keep on, who sets an example who is there when we're sad, someone who stands by, someone who we can trust. The Lord Jesus Christ is an encourager. He, he's a genuine friend. He's not an encourager in a dishonest way. He doesn't uh, tell us, you know, good things when we need to know bad things. And he certainly doesn't encourage what is wrong. And he knows. Now, we saw this truth um, Sunday morning. We sang Psalm 139 last Sunday morning. Um, we, we saw this truth in relation to, to, to Hagar. God who sees. And it's the same God here who walks in the midst of the churches. He knows all that is going on. It ought to strike fear into the people of God. Uh, read the pages of the Old Testament. And, and what do we see? That the children of Israel so often reverted to, to the merely human and they forgot really that God was in their midst and they got angry with God. They got angry with Moses. They, you know, they did all sorts of things. They, they, they demonstrated really that there was very little, if any, fear of God in so many of them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and there, there, there wasn't obvious fear in so much that they were willing to do. It, it made it perfectly clear. But the Lord Jesus Christ walks in the midst of the churches and how careful we ought to be. He, he has eyes like a flame of fire. Remember that back in uh, chapter 1 and verse 14? His eyes like a flame of fire. He sees everything. And so now we read of a problem. The commentator has put it like this. He says, one of the saddest words in the Bible. Because we read tragically, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Here's something tragic. Here's something extremely sad. Shift, says the commentator, from commendation to condemnation. Shift from commendation to condemnation. And here is a tragedy. The Lord Jesus Christ knew of their works and their stand, and there's something very positive about that. But now he's going to speak of something extremely hidden and secret, for we're told these people had left their first love. It's a tragedy. They'd lost their first love. The verb is in the perfect. Um, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your, your first love, but I know your works, you see. 
I am having known. These things might be hidden from the eyes of men, but they're known to God. And so we made passing reference there to Ananias and Sapphira. I have no idea what the other members of the church there in Jerusalem knew about Ananias and Sapphira and their transactions. It might surprise us for, for all we know. Perhaps it was, it was out there and people knew. Or was it simply that the information came from God? Well, whatever, let's be clear about this. When Peter speaks, he says, um, he, he speaks of them having lied to the Holy Spirit. They thought they could lie um, and get away with it. Sometimes our words are um, erroneous, they're in error, and we say something and it's not true, but it's by mistake, and that's bad enough. But sometimes words are barefaced lies and they they taught a to, you know taught, taught, taught a barefaced lie there are all sorts of um tests and techniques and different things that can be done just take the medical um issue um and you can have this test done and that test done and the the idea is that it it, it um you know indicates there are problems earlier on so that they can be dealt with at an earlier stage and so on um, but there's no indication that what was going on here was known to anyone so if Ananias and Sapphira might have been known out in that congregation in Jerusalem I don't know there was no indication but the Lord Jesus knows he knows he knows what is going on the book of Malachi the last book of the Old Testament God knew what was going on and so ask the question there this evening how could this be we've seen these folk wonderfully strident for the truth how could it be how could it be that you know the Lord Jesus could be saying I know your works your labor your patience and so on and, and your perseverance and, and and all these wonderful things verse 6 um, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, so much that is, that is positive here. But then you've got verses four and five, slap bang in the middle. How come? How come? We know, don't we, that um, when we were first converted, there was a degree of excitement and emotion. I'm not trying to say that everybody's conversion experience is identical, for I'm sure it's not. But I, I imagine for, for many, many, there's a, there's a sense of that first love, that realization um, that God has loved me and given himself for me. And what a wonderful truth um, that is. I remember the day I got converted and, and coming back to my room there in university and writing a, a verse out sticking it up on the door <laughs> you know you, you look back and you think <laughs> but anyway that's what I did obviously there was <laughs> a degree of emotion and something that I had been wrestling with for many weeks and burdened under um, the conviction of my wrong my sin um, finally the issue was resolved and the eyes had been opened and um, a, a degree of emotion and joy and so on. I'm not sure I understood everything clearly, but a degree of emotion and, and, and so on. Um, is that the reference here? Was it just novelty that was lost? No, no I, don't, I don't think so. But surely he does mean by first love that that fresh, that new, that responsive love for him who first loved us. Surely they'd known a clarity, understanding how much God had loved them, that God had given his son for them. They'd felt the power of that. They'd known the wonder of that, that they'd been brought out of darkness and into God's most marvelous light. But tragically, it would seem from the words that we have here that they'd lost that, and I'm going to use this, this phrase if I can, that innocence of love, 
There was an innocence of love. They simply loved God because they knew they'd been loved. There was an innocence. It wasn't contrived. It, you, you didn't need to press the buttons to get it going again. There was an innocence of love. What had happened, I don't know. I, I realize that sometimes folk get hurt in the Christian life, sometimes in, in the dealings of God, sometimes in the dealings of men, and they can pull back. There's, there's no indication of what the cause was here. Maybe that's a good thing, and, and it covers all the bases. Um, we need to be careful that we don't stop in the Christian life because, you know, we find difficulty with God's dealings, and we just give up or because we find people awkward and so we just give up on the whole of you know christendom because there are people who are blatantly awkward and difficult no um the, the, these folk they'd seemingly lost or at least in root they lost the innocence of love i've got this against you that you have left your first love. Now, it's striking, isn't it? It's striking. The children of Israel, very sadly, very tragically, um, would, would do just this. I'm going to turn to a passage. I, I didn't read it. It's too long. But I'm just going to take a few little bits and bobs from it in, in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is sent to this people. And, and, and this is part of what he's told. Chapter 2. I'm not going to read extensively. Just little bits. Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I will remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Israel had been so full of excitement and of joy. And yet things had changed. Things had changed. What injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me and have followed idols and become idolaters? Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why has he plundered? The young lions roared at him and growled. They made his land waste and so on. You see, that there, there's a problem here. Of old, says God, I've broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And yet you said, I, and you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot and so on. How can you say I'm not polluted? As a thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. Now, I'm just picking um, verses there, really, from that chapter. But it's the same sort of issue, isn't it, really, that... You know, to, to begin with, they had been in love with God. They'd seen the wonder, that crossing of the Red Sea. But sadly and tragically, it doesn't seem to have taken long and they've walked away from God in heart. You know, they might, they might you know, put it into a New Testament present day context. They're still coming to the door, through the doors. They're still there in church. They're still turning up. But the heart, the heart, there's a problem. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, a certain defect in her inner life. Was it that, um, you know, those originally converted in Ephesus had cooled? Was it that, um, you know, a following generation, the, the young people coming on and things were hopeful, but they had failed people who'd grown up in, in 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 church was it people who'd been converted as the life of the church had progressed well we don't we don't know the answer to any of that we don't know but it seems to have been widespread why do i say that because we've got the the singular here nevertheless i have this against and, and we're going to say that in modern day english you but if we were reading the authorized version we we'd be looking at the singular and we'd be referring to, to thee or thou at that point. Um, thou hast left thy first love. And they're viewed as a collective. And collectively, it seems, the temperature. Something was wrong. There was a problem. Something was wrong. 
Did it all look well? Well, apparently so. But underneath there was disease. There was disease. There's an awful lot of talk these days, isn't there, about renewables and whether you've got things on your roof producing electricity or whether you're in sight of a, um, I'm going to call it a windmill, or probably a, a, a turbine or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the problem with all these devices is that they don't store electricity. And so there's all sorts of effort going into storing electricity. There's due to be some kind of um, system under the la, la lock and they're going to compress air as a means of storing electricity. Um, sometimes it's pumping water, but you kind of need the geography for that um, because you need water to go up and then come down uh, and so on. You get that in Wales. Um, one one uh, of, of the latest ideas there is to, to spin uh, a very large flywheel. And so the idea is that when electricity or whatever it is, wind power is available um, during the night, I suppose, and it's not being used, you'll spin this very large flywheel. And then when uh, electricity is needed during the day, you'll be able to use, to harness the energy kinetic energy, it's moving energy, in this flywheel and uh, make it then into electrical energy. Have these folk ceased to spin? Were, 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 they, were they not spinning in the same way? It raises the obvious question, well, what of us? And it is very searching, isn't it? Um, Again, says the commentator, church without love cannot remain. The Lord Jesus Christ um, sees it here. And apparently it couldn't be seen, but sometimes perhaps it can be seen. And so there's an indifference to doctrine. And people aren't really interested in God's truth. They're there at church. The bodies are there, but they're not really interested. They're not really interested in growing. They're not really interested in being found out and searched and turning back to God. And there's a, an element of immunity to God's dealings. Um, it comes to evangelism and th there's no real interest. They're not willing to make the sacrifices that are needed if that sort of thing is gonna be done. Um, you know, folk are tied to the world and we talked there on Sunday evening about money and so on. They're tied to their houses. They're tied to, you know, to, to, to this area of life. And it's perfectly obvious that this is what floats their boat. They're numb to sin. And so things that perhaps, you know, before they would have kept well away from, they've become used to and they, they harbor them. Um, even to, to things that are blatantly wrong, even illegal. Or simply that they need amused in church life. They need amusement. They don't want the rigor of God's word anymore. They want to be amused in some way or other. Now, it's very searching. Um, where are we? Is it that we love him because he first loved us? Or have we lost to some extent, our first love. Are we there to encourage? <laughs> or are we there to discourage? Through complaining and moaning and groaning. Searching, searching issues. The complaint voiced. But secondly, the correction. The correction required. The correction required. The Lord Jesus Christ puts his finger on the problem here. But notice then the correction required. What was to be done? Notice that before the, uh, we go anywhere there this evening, they needed to hear what the Spirit was saying. Look at verse 7. We need to take that on board. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We need to be listening for God, the Spirit. Where does he speak? In his word. And if love is the mainspring of true religion, which it, which it is, how can we hope to keep it in the tip? top condition that it needs to be in if we're not going to listen to God. We need to be careful to listen, don't we? 
And before we get to that word repent, which we'll come to in a moment, we need to be listening. When we hear God's word, it highlights things about us. And we need to respond to that. But before we do anything else, we need to hear. It's important, isn't it, to get exercise for your physical heart. And we're told about a walk or a, whatever it is that you do, go and do it. It's good for your heart. It's important to get exercise to look after the heart. And can I put it like this? It's important to get exercise to look after the, the heart, as the Bible so often speaks about it. The heart that is the very centre of your spiritual being. So you need exercise to look after your physical heart, but you need exercise to look after your spiritual heart, if I can put it like that. The book of Proverbs, of course, chapter 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The Christian life springs out of the heart. It's critical that we look after the heart. And, and absolutely vital to looking after the heart is this element of what I call exercise, the spiritual exercise of hearing. Hearing the Spirit. Hearing the Spirit of God through his word. We need to be hearing. But it's not just mere hearing, it's responding. And so the word that we have then in verse 5 is repent. It's a word that means to change your mind. That's what happens when a person gets converted. There's a new mind on things. We mentioned this on Sunday morning there in reference to Hagar because she needed to turn again. She needed to go back. She needed to repent. And repentance is at the heart of conversion, isn't it? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's not um, a slight deviation or alteration. He's a new, listen to the word, creation. Creation. Uh, we mentioned the Beatitudes. And, you know, there's a, a new poverty of spirit that Jesus describes. There's a mourning over sin. There's a meekness, a willing now, willingness to fit in with God. There's a, a hunger and thirst to do what is right. There's a turning around. A turning around. And, and that has to be part of conversion. There's no conversion without it. There's a, a new mind. But it's not just the mind. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. It was about um, the mind, certainly. But it was about repent and do. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For any even is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes his way, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, God's word, and continues in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. The word repent here um, is in the aorist. Now, um, the aorist is, I don't want to get lost in all this, but the aorist is, is what you would, it's a sort of a past tense, but it's to be distinguished from um, a tense that, so I was riding my bike. That's in the past, but it was a continuous action. I rode my bike. And it, it's pointing to something that is more sort of a, a pointed occasion. The word here is repent. And it's in the aorist, and it carries, therefore, the sense of you need to make a break with this. You need to make a, a, a break. You need to break with this wrong attitude. There needs to be an acknowledgement that there's wrong. It can be easy to be lackadaisical in the Christian life. Um, and, you know, to let things go. They needed to hone in on this and they needed to repent and they needed to do again says the commentator once again the life of the church must spring forth from the root of true love in Jesus Christ he's not looking for handle turning he's not looking for them to turn up in a better outfit to church it's none of that you know when the Christian life falters it can be reduced to that. And I'm there. <laughs> you, know, you want to sort of assert this because somehow this is brownie points. The real question is, is your heart there? 
That's the real question. And that's not the end of it, for they needed to remember, verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. They needed to remember. And if repent is in that aorist tense, not wanting to get into the technicalities, remember is in the present tense. Be remembering. Our, our memories um, of some things are long. We can sometimes remember things that have hurt us. Part of what, you know, we're struggling to understand what's going on here with Ukraine and, and Russia. But part of what drives Russia is that the memory of the death of 20, 25 million um, of their people in World War II. And, and that goes extremely deep. We may not figure with that, but it does. There are things we long remember, but there are things that we quickly forget. We quickly forget what God has done for us and what it means to run with God and to know the joy of the Lord to be our strength. But we need to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Think what you used to be like. Think about the delight you had in helping in the work of God, the concern that you had to try and encourage others and see where you are now. These people had lost, or at least it had begun. They were losing their first love. The complaint voiced, the correction required, but the consequence declared. And let's be clear, this was all very serious. There seem to be two outcomes mentioned here. The first is that their candlestick, their church, be removed. The church would come to an end, put it simply. And so presently the problem was only in its first stages. Perhaps no one could even see it or sense it. Yet there was a stark possibility of the most awful outcome. One of the seven um, candlesticks would be removed altogether. The very beginnings of this loss of love could mean the loss of the whole church through time. It's a stark warning from the one who has the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the candlesticks, verse 1. And it's no vain warning, it's no empty threat. That word threat is very much on our minds at the moment, especially after what Mr. Putin, Putin said there last week. Um, we might think, well, this is over the top, and it's just a, a threat, and so on. It's just a threat. This was just a threat. Well, I'm afraid it wasn't just a threat. And you're probably aware that, tragically, Ephesus was lost. The warning couldn't be more stark. The outcome couldn't be worse. And sometimes churches come to an end. And we can see that in a natural way. Maybe sometimes we need to wonder about the words that we have here. There's another outcome, however, and um, it's far brighter. To him who overcomes, verse 7, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And there's a warning to the church here as a whole. But the, the promise, by contrast, comes to the individual. Do you notice that? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so if they're viewed as a collective in terms of the warning, they're viewed as individuals in terms of the promise and the blessing. And the promise here is to the one who endures, walking with his God. And the promise is of the tree of life. Um... Man surely longs for that which he lost in the Garden of Eden. Man surely is conscious that for all the wonderfulness of his being, and from our perspective, his creation, something is deficient, something is lost. Well, wonderfully promised here is that all of that deficiency, all of that loss would be gone. He would eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, right in the middle, right in the middle. Revelation 22, 
And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. They shall be, there shall be no light night there. They shall need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. What a wonderful promise belongs to the faithful people of God. God. How careful is the message for that first love, that, I use that word, that innocence of love, a love that's simply ready to give back to God, to love him who first loved me, a love that isn't always calculating and making excuses, um, a love that knows there's a cost, but it's, it's not working it out, it's ready to pay the cost. Um, a love that hasn't degenerated into a stage play, miming the lines. Um, on the stage at the right time, playing the part of a Christian. A love that hasn't learnt to respond with the minimum. And I just give God the minimum to sort of keep in there, really, to keep part of the club. No. It's an innocent love, a fresh love. It, it knows well the love of the Saviour. And it simply wants to love him. Well, let's turn to God then in prayer, shall we? Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we turn into your most holy presence. We thank you that you are full of grace and mercy, of kindness and of blessing. We thank you for the God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we pray, Lord, help us that we may treasure you, that we may love you, that we may love him who first loved us. Grant us, O oh God, that we may be kept well away uh, from a, a performance. Keep us, keep us well away, we, we pray, O oh God, from wanting to appear. Help us to love you. Help us to serve you. Help us to honour you day by day by day. And repeatedly and consistently so. For these are prayers we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.